This episode is brought to you with Stone Marley's Great War Aerodrome. Hello and welcome to the Aviators Lounge with me, Andy Jones and Tony Dyer. Uh, tonight we're talking all about First World War Aviation, or rather the Great War. Um, Great War. And we're broadcasting here from Solent Sky in front of their new First World War exhibition with this magnificent Avro 504 behind us. And we are also um, very pleased to be joined by Ian Flint, CEO of, um, let me get this absolutely right, Stowe Maris. Absolutely. Uh, Stowe Stow Maris. I've got the pronunciation right. Stowe Maris, Great War Aerodrome in Essex. Absolutely. Sounds Glad to be here. Great stuff. Sounds really interesting. Really looking forward to talking to you about that. First off, though, I got an opportunity to have a look around here a bit earlier. Um, and here's what I saw. This exhibition is fascinating. It's all about First World War aviation in this area, the Solent, and this map demonstrates that really well. We're up here at the moment in Southampton. You've got Southampton Water, and below here is the Isle of Wight, and the whole area is referred to as the Solent. Now, in the First World War, this here, this is Calshot, that was a flying boat base. In fact, an aircraft that was based here was the first aircraft to take out a German U-boat in the channel. Across the water, you had another flying boat base at Leon Solent. Behind Leon Solent, you had Gosport Airfield, and that was where Smith Barry set up the first special school of flying in 1916. Now, revolutionized flying training. Up here, you've got Hamble. There was an Avro factory there, AV Road came down from Manchester and established a factory there, building aircraft very much like the Avro 504 that's behind us at the moment. Up in Southampton, you had Noel Pemberton Billing who'd established Supermarine Aviation Works. That was building Admiralty aircraft in 1914. And there was a couple of other aircraft manufacturers in Southampton here and on the Isle of Wight. North of Southampton was Eastleigh and what we now know today as Southampton Airport. In 1918, Eastley Airfield was the biggest US Navy airbase outside of America. Today, the US boasts one of the largest and most advanced fleet of naval aircraft in the world. However, in 1917, there was only one US Navy airbase and only a handful of pilots with little or no combat experience. While across the Atlantic, there had been huge developments in naval air power on both sides of the Western Front. When the US Navy entered the war, as far as aviation was concerned, they were on the back foot. This was all about to change as the service went into rapid expansion. Aircraft were purchased, pilots and crews were enrolled, and air bases sprang up all over America and in Europe. In the early part of 1918, the United States decided to set up a naval aviation force with the objective of destroying the enemy submarine bases in Belgium. This force was to be known as the Northern Bombing Group, and it was based at Eastley Airfield, or Southampton Airport, as it's now known. In the short time it was open, a fair number of crews were trained here. In fact, at its peak, over 4,000 US servicemen were based at Eastley. That I found fascinating. I didn't realize mm. that that, as it said in there, that it was the biggest US Navy airbase outside of America in 1918. It was Amazing. literally up the road, what we now know as Southampton Airport. Yep. Um, and the expansion also of the Americans going into, into the war um, from 1917 to 1918. It was such a short period of time. But okay. I gather that there was, the US were airmen were on the East Coast as well. They, yeah, absolutely. We had uh, seaplanes operating out of the northern part of the Thames Estuary on the East Coast. Right. Um, but even towards the close of the war, they were still using various bases, including Stomari's, as a training establishment. Wow. And we, we know full well we had um, American cadets uh, going through Stomari's, uh, they were noted in the logs as being very well behaved. <laughs> <laughs> so could we add, uh, so could you claim then that Stomari's was one of the first Top Gun academies? <laughs> uh, uh, I think that would be thin, but hey, I'll give it a go. Uh, well, you, uh, you, you like riding a motorbike, you down, down the runway, you could relive that kind of Tom Cruise moment. That would yeah, mm. Slightly more hair needed, I think. <laughs> Goose on the back. <laughs> yeah. There's a joke there, we're not going to go into. No. Yeah, good, good, good stuff. <laughs> Excellent. Right, one of, the, one of the features we do on the show, Ian, is um, Tony here is an avid collector of all things aeronautical. Junk. And uh, we, oh, well, well, we junk, some yes. will call it junk, um, others will call it interesting parts. And we do Tony's show and tell. Now, Tony, what have you brought us this evening I, to have a look uh, at? Right, and this is interesting. Oh, I've brought coming a small up. Oh, it's small. box. So, would you like to look at it first? Yeah, okay. Um, I'll, I'll, let me have a, I'll have, a, have a quick look over it. Right, it's so we've got a, quite easy. A brass box 
Um, yeah, well, it looks obviously it's off an aircraft. Um, it looks quite weird. Well, this well, I, you can I, tell, I presume it's period then. It looks very first world war. Ian, what do you make of that? Let's have a. Would you like to borrow my glasses? No, no, no. not at all, not at all, not at all. So we've got obviously cable in point there, switch controls, um, and uh, it's obviously a selector switch off and on power to something and as the fact it's got written on their dashboard lighting one would assume this is what turns all the dials on, on an aircraft <laughs> yeah indeed there we go my curators would be proud of me <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so basically it's uh, it's absolutely quite a delightful thing it says mark three airplane dashboard lighting <laughs> which i love it's a nice sort of mahogany box similar sort of mahogany to what the propellers were made from off and on and then it's got it shows how Interesting it is. You've got airspeed, compass, aneroid, so that's the height. So those, the, the, those are the lighting ones, ones yeah. yeah. Rev indicator, so the RPM of the engine, yeah. the beautifully named miscellaneous. <laughs> and then you've got on number one, on number two. So you had two batteries. So you had a, and what would happen is you would just select the lights on as you wanted. So what aircraft is that off then? Well, this would have been fitted to aircraft that ended up doing night flight. Oh, so right. Things like um, Sop with Dolphin, Camel, anything uh, SE5. And they just had literally little lights uh, just so you could read the instruments That's and things like that. That's quite advanced, isn't it, for that yeah. sort of period? And I love, I love the fact that when you get this sort of First World War sort of technology, that does not look like it's come out of an aircraft. That looks like mm. it's come off your grandmother's sort of light switch, doesn't yeah. it? Off the, it is. Uh, uh, in a pantry or something. It's, um, that's quite well, remarkable. Well, it's an echo of the, of the skills that were being used at that time because the people that were making these aircraft were cabinet makers mm. yeah. and coachwork builders. That's it. Um, these weren't airframe technicians. Mm. They were literally people who could make yeah. pianos for you because and the skills were needed. And if you look at some of the manufacturers that put them together, not, not shorts and things like that, but the sort of, if you like, the subcontracting factories like Waring and Gillow, um, which also went on to build Horser gliders in the mm. Second World War, they were again making use of those um, trades. Yeah. And that was a reserved occupation as well. If you were a real good craftsperson working in wood, you would probably not uh, have to go to the front. So you said mahogany? Well, it looks like mahogany. Well, it looks like yeah. mahogany, because that's actually, is mahogany quite a heavy wood to put into an aircraft? Um, yeah, well, it can be, but propeller, it's very durable. Very du All right, so, because when you look at that, you don't think, I'm not sure they've gotten around to thinking about lightness with a, no. with a piece of, of equipment like that. Interesting. Fascinating stuff. So well, I think it was brought in fairly late, um, sort of mid to late war, when mm. they actually realised they were going to be night fighting against Zeppelins. Because right. the Zeppelins would obviously come over. So this is very, very, very appropriate then to Stone Maris, yeah, isn't I it? Yeah, I mean, mm. we, we had uh, BE-2Es and the, the, that sort of fitting would never been on BE-2E as one of the first display mm. of 30, 37 squadrons. Primarily because it didn't matter if you had dashboard lights, the fact is your exhausts were glowing white hot anyway by that time. So oh, you God. could be spotted like two red or white eyes mm. in the middle of the darkness anyway. So if you had dashboard lights, it really didn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. And um, this is going in my Sop with Camel cockpit. Ah, right. Now, tell you, right, so you've got this, uh, I, you've, I've seen bits of it. Mm. Um, we'll put some pictures up of this, but you've got a ca uh, Camel cockpit, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, my grandfather had uh, the, it looks like a diving bell, but it's yeah. the compass on it, it was like a diving bell. And uh, it went right in the middle of the Sopwith Camel cockpit or whatever aircraft it would be. And when he was eight years old, he used to be in Felixstowe and he would um, go um, sailing out, uh, funnily enough, near another flying boat base, based at uh, Felixstowe, the seaplanes base. And uh, he bought this from a little junk shop. So, me being me, I built a cockpit around <laughs> this compass. Sounds it was like, nice to pick this up. Sounds like a very Tony Dyer project, that. That it sounds does, great. Yeah. We'll put some pictures up of that. That sounds great. All right, Ian, Stone Maris. Um, Stone Maris is, is gr the Stone Maris Great War Aerodrome. It's the largest known surviving group of uh, Royal Flying Corps buildings on a World War I aerodrome. It's a live airfield, a museum, and looking through your website, it seems to be a, a unique ven uh, venue. We like to think so. Yes. Um, we like to think so. The, the, the project itself. It's a, a roughly £22 million project, and that's to, to restore it to its full glory, for want of a better phrase. Um, we've got 22 uh, extant buildings, and they are the original buildings, which, as a renovation project, brings in all sorts of complications. Um, you know, what you can drill where, what you can bang into what, and uh, how you can fix things. So are they listed, then? Absolutely. Uh, wow. uh, everything is two-star listed. Oh, so my goodness. 
um, the next grading above that is Stonehenge. You know, mm -hmm. that, that's how rare. And they're also at risk as well. They're considered to be on the at-risk register. Um, the entire site is on the at-risk register. Uh, and now we're in this wonderful situation where we've got a huge momentum that's built up. We've got a number of the buildings that are, are now officially ready to come off the register. Um, but the site as a whole has to come off the register right, right. before you can do it. So it's kind of all or nothing. Um, but these things don't stand still. So therefore, buildings that we have done emergency works on are now coming around to the point where the emergency works need more emergency works because uh, the emergency works yes. are running out. You know. right. So I, I, it really is a, a, an emergency sort of situation. We're doing everything we can. We've got um, modern hangars full of aircraft. We've got uh, over 160 volunteers. Uh, we won the Queen's Award for Volunteering services oh last year, which is like the MBE for volunteering, yeah. which is great. That's, that was awarded 2nd of June this year um, because it worked out and it sticks in my head. I'm very proud of it. The figure that sticks in my head is uh, year ending March 19, we uh, delivered 30,130 hours of volunteering wow. in the previous 12 months. That's, that's, yeah. um, so it's something to behold. And they are a cracking team. They keep me in line, there's no <laughs> doubt about it. Um, Lots, of, lots going on all the time. Right. So the, the actual history of Stone Marys goes back to it opened in 1916, is that yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, the, the site itself began life in uh, 1909 when uh, the Turner family bought uh, the land to farm it. Uh, compulsorily purchased by the War Office not so long later, actually. The uh, large section of the Turner family land and some adjoining farmland from the Evans family was purchased and that was late 16. Uh, the Royal Engineers were let loose. Uh, the winter of 16, there was a big white Bessonneau canvas hangar and a number of canvas tents. And having done a winter at Stowe in brick buildings, <laughs> God alone knows how, <laughs> how they coped with that. There was a, a B flight of uh, 37 Squadron moved in shortly after. Um, and then things really kicked off in earnest. Uh, by the close of the war, there was over 350 people living on site. There was at least 40 wooden buildings, there was four hangars, there was all four flights plus the HQ squadron, yeah. um, and it was a thriving base mm. uh, and, and very successful as well. Right. So, I mean, we, we spoke about this briefly before we, we started, but of course a lot of people, when you think First World War, your, your mind goes to trenches and tin helmets, and yet there was so much more yeah, going so. on, wasn't it? And, and Stone Marys, you're out in Essex, why, what, what, what was special about that location? We know what was going on here, but why, why Essex? Why was it...? Um, it it's all down to uh, a certain Rear Admiral of the German Navy who said the very first thing we must do within days of war being declared, we must bomb London. Oh. Mm. That's simple, we must. Um, and he stated very clearly, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he stated very clearly that the psychological effect would be strong enough to discourage the war effort. Uh, let alone if any damage was actually done. It wouldn't matter. We could reach out and touch them, and that's what he wanted. Um, and in response to that, uh, the, uh, the, initially the Royal Navy had been given the job, and they said, look, we can't, con we can't control the sea lanes, can we can't fight that and look after the, the, the capital. So it was handed back to the Royal Flying Corps, and they set up two circular defence areas, um, basically looking at the navigational aids of the river outlets, so the Thames, ah, the Black right. Water, so, the Crouch. So that's what the Zeppelins are looking for. They're looking to yeah. come up the Thames as yeah. they're coming over. So, and right. we'd spot them coming over with light ships or maybe observer posts. And then by a variety of different communication tools, it then gets relayed out by uh, telephone to the stations. Uh, and that's great in theory. Unfortunately, the aircraft we're operating at the start of hostilities take too long to get up there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we have to find them. Right. Um, so unfortunately, generally, we caught one on the way back. But having right. said that, the Zeppelins weren't that effective to start with anyway. I mean, the first mm. raids in North Norfolk, for instance, they basically smashed some windows and killed a cow, and that was mm. about it. It was only when they started improving and tragedy started to strike. Mm. Well, they certainly did cause a lot of aggro and sadness. And, uh, well, like you say, it's a psychological thing, oh, isn't yeah. it? The, but you look at the postcards of the time, and mm. there's pictures, and they're colorized pictures, and it says, death of the baby killer with a, a, a Zeppelin going down in flames, which is quite a, a we, powerful we, we, message. Uh, we're very lucky at uh, Stomaris that we're, we're in a partnership with what is now known as the Mayflower School. that used to be known as the Upper Street North School in the Isle of Dogs, just by Canby. Um, and uh, the, uh, the school there was attacked in June 17, and uh, unfortunately there was a number of children that were killed. And it was during a daylight raid which was twice as bad because everyone was fascinated by these wonderful flying machines. Mm, God. So people are running out in these really packed manufacturing and, and, and dense residential areas. Look at these yeah. wonderful aircraft in the sky. And obviously they're therefore instant victims to shrapnel. Yeah. Um, and one of the bombs actually went straight through the roof of the Mayflower School as it is now, right, in, right into the cellar. Um, 
we rotate all of the pupils of that school through Stomaris. They come up every couple of years, they all come up all right. and they spend the day with us. And we have uh, exhibition about it. We have various objects that we can talk about. But the impact, the psychological impact. Mm. It must have been terrifying, huge. isn't it? Because yeah. it's almost science fiction-like, isn't it? You think about mm. what an airship looks like and just coming... H.G. Wells, yeah. the war in the or air. The war. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. He prophesied in all but name. He prophesied the way that the war could be fought. Mm. Uh, and it was involving Zeppelins. So, uh, yeah, it, uh, it is exactly that. Mm. Science fiction became science fact. Interesting stuff. Interesting. Yeah. So, how how difficult was it to shoot down a zeppelin? And you say um, you mainly got them on the way back, but I suppose seeing something like that at night must have been it was intensely difficult. I mean, if we take into account the size of these things, there's an argument that says, well, of course you can see them. Of course you can. They're flying higher than you are. They're flying faster than you are. They're white. It's dark. <laughs> if they were in, in spotlight over the capital, then maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, it was remarkably difficult. If you could catch up with them, it was remarkably difficult. Mm -hmm. And even if you could see them. Let's not forget, it wasn't that easy to actually set them on fire. There's this wonderful no. idea yeah. that you, you, you shoot them and they go bang and they catch on fire and that's that. Well, actually, no. Um, the, the rounds that we were discharging through the, the weaponry we had weren't designed for that. Right. They were designed to take out bits of people. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the ballistic bubble that's pushed through a human body that causes a massive exit wound is only there because of the resistance. Well, if you're pushing through essentially sausage skin, in all but name, yeah. mm -hmm. then there's no resistance and it's all broken down into different cells, unless you strike something that causes a, a spark, the chances are it's not going to catch. I, mm. I, do, I never knew that. I, I, I just assumed that, yeah, one bullet and that was it. Yeah. <laughs> if only. And, yeah, if only. Yeah. I, think, I think they had uh, incendiary rounds later that were a Towards bit the end of it, yeah, mm. towards the end of it, the, the Martin Hale round and then the Buckingham mm. round. But even then, mm. we're looking at a, a .303 rimfire incendiary round as opposed to the later. If we look at the, the uh, ammunition that was used in the Second World War, for instance, mm. a 20 millimeter incendiary cannon shell, there is no contest. A, a, a 303 makes a horrible mess of a human being. Um, mm. But actually, as an aircraft round, it really mm. isn't up to much at all. So with Stowe then, with Stowe Maris, um, after the First World War, what happens then? Uh, well, a very, very successful period uh, of training for a variety of people, including the American cadets I mentioned. Mm. Uh, and then they decided that they needed to centralise fighter response. And we had, in Stowe, we had some very, very skilled individuals. So they grabbed all the mobiles and the immobiles, the people that were stationed with the squadron and the people that were stationed with the base. They moved them all to Biggin Hill, downloaded right. their brain, mm. then said thank you very much and essentially demobilised them. Mm. Right. There's some that stayed in, but as, to all intents and purposes, yeah. demobilised it. Slammed a padlock on the gates and said thank you very much, we don't need Stowe anymore. Um, mm. The only incursion the Second World War had on it was when an aircraft on the way back from a bombing raid decided to have a crack at it because it still had hangers. Oh, right. Yes, they were filled <laughs> with cattle, but they were hangers. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it took, dropped a stick of bombs, took out a section of our blacksmith's forge, took out oh. half of the communications building, and took out the hangers. Right. Apart from that, it stayed still uh, until 2008, when uh, with a little bit of help from Essex County Council and a little bit of help from Malden District Council, the Heritage Memorial Fund came in with a big fat check and said, OK, buy it for the nation. Brilliant. Um, it's a su success story, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, it bumped along with a little bit of money and some good earnest people for a, a year or so, and then uh, another cash injection, a very, very nice grant uh, from the LIBOR Fund. Uh -huh. mm. uh, and that gave us the, the, the wherewithal to get going. So that's, uh, we started really in earnest in around 2016. Right. Uh, and it's kind of not been stopped since. We've oh, I was <laughs> going to say, you look so busy with everything I've, uh, yeah. say I've seen on social media and on your website. What activities do you get up to then? What happens in at Stowe now? <sighs> right, uh, let's start from left to right, shall we? So uh, the RE Workshops, first brick building on site, uh, once a month we have the Stokers uh, initiative. Stokers, um, despite being a naval term, uh, stands, it's, well, Honestly, uh, it was what was written across the top of my pad when myself and a number of my colleagues sat down to plan it. And it stands for Stomari's Kids Doing Education Rockets and Stuff. Um, and, and, and that's where it came to life. And now thanks to a huge amount of effort from a great deal of volunteers from local education establishments and all sorts, it's attracted its own funding now for a couple of years. And on the first Saturday of every month, you can find 30 or 40 young people and their families. It's not a drop off, they come in with their families. Mm, yeah. Uh, and, and they do everything from build aircraft models to making rocket cars to building and working My with flight goodness. simulation. Uh, it, it, won, it won the Essex Chairman's, uh, County Council Chairman's Award 
uh, last year. We're very proud of that. So that's Stokers. Um, that, uh, STEM as well? Yeah, it's all, it's all part of the STEM agenda. Fantastic. Um, and we're tied in with all sorts of local, local groups about that, and we're very proud of that. Uh, mm -hmm. They coding, uh, 3D robotics printing, and all sorts of stuff. I mean, literally everything. It's all, it's all there. I hate to obvious plug, but it's, it's there yeah, on the yeah, website. Yeah. Yeah, um, we've got two hangars of aircraft. They're temporary hangars by nature, but permanent hangars by permission. So they've got, uh, we're in museum partnership at the moment with uh, two uh, heritage aircraft collections, the Bianchi Collection and the World War One Aviation Heritage Trust. Oh, right. um, so we've got uh, B2E uh, that flies, Albatross that flies, uh, Fokker Eindecker, Newport 17. Um, we've got, uh, there's a Blériot, 11 we've got a Moran bullet um, plus we've got a number of modern aircraft that hang in there which hope to pay the bills mm -hmm. uh, we've got uh, three permanent exhibitions ranging from uh, Royal Britannia which is about the women at war um, ranging right the way through the uh, the spy side of stuff through to nursing but also we've got introductions to the RFC and we've also got a exhibition dedicated to 37 squadron uh, which is housed in the old B flight offices and you throw into that a, a full cafe in the old airman's mess so you can sit down see all this in the buildings that used to happen in on the site it used to happen possibly see a BE2E take off and then you can sit mm. in the airman's mess and have a cup of tea and a sarni where they sat in the airman's mess and had a cup of tea and a sarni yes. well it's a bit embarrassing because I, I I've been watching Stone Marie's um, happen in, in since uh, 2000 ish and uh, but I don't know an awful lot about it until well, I didn't know this, this is, is a fantastic. real hidden gem. I think we're going to get out there. We are going to have this. to get up there, and I like good. the idea of the. Um, no, I need to ask you: do, with your well. with your cafe, do you sit down and have an authentic cup of tea in a chipped enamel oh, mug? Oh yes. <laughs> no, <laughs> but but uh, we have a volunteers' crew room, which is actually in one of the off buildings of the RE workshop, and racked against the walls are, and I'm not exaggerating, over a hundred enamel mugs. And the true definition of success, and I can say this with some pride, is when you have an enamel mug presented to you with your name on it. Ooh. Now, as you can imagine, with a, it has to be said, a predominantly male section for the volunteering of that nature, there's a lot of Mikes and Johns, and so you get a number. Um, and we're up to John 7, I think we're up to Mike 8, and I am at the Should dizzying... Should have a Mark 8. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, possibly, yeah. I am, I, I'm Ian 2. Ian uh, oh. But uh, yeah. because I, I was, I, I've been accepted by the volunteers as someone who, who generally seems to not make things go too badly wrong, um, I actually have my own mug on a little spray-painted gold shelf now. And uh, <laughs> as long as I put my money in the, in the teapot, then I'm welcome to come in and have a cup of tea with the guys twice a week. Bring the old packet of biscuits, I'm sure. Oh, I, I couldn't go to the Dizzy Heights of their biscuits. They've got very expensive tastes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> you, you mentioned the Bianchi collection. Is, mm. is this the old personal plane services, Tony Bianchi? It is, it oh, is, right, yeah. Okay. Um, we haven't got all of his stuff, but we, uh, we've got a number of his items, a number of his objects in the collections, mm. and we've got a number of his aircraft in the hangar. Oh, right. So they used to have some First World War engines. Yeah, we haven't got those, unfortunately. No. What we've got, uh, we've, got some, we've got a couple of engines. Um, we've, uh, we've been very lucky that uh, through the auspices of World War I Aviation Heritage Trust, uh, Oliver Wolf has lent us a couple of engines mm. for one of our exhibitions. Um, we uh, took very great care to um, reproduce uh, a photograph we've got of a, a mechanic working on an engine, uh, a, a V engine. Um, in, in the, one of the hangars. We've got a black and white original photograph of it, and we've recreated that in one of the museum exhibitions. And it's great, apart from the fact that it's obviously in front of a window, so when you're locking up the site at night and you walk past it, the security lights come on and <laughs> you can see a guy leaning over an engine and there's not a night goes past where it doesn't give you the shivers. It's absolutely, yeah. the faces are so lifelike. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was going to ask you that, actually. Being a First World War at aerodrome like that, have you got a good ghost? Have you got a yeah, ghost? Got a... <laughs> we do not discuss that. <laughs> oh. I, I must admit, um, social media being what it is nowadays, um, I did post something up uh, to do with Halloween 2019. The way we look at it, is, and I, this is what I said on the post, is we walk with ghosts every day. If you <laughs> can uh, yeah. walk around Stomari's Great War Aerodrome in the early hours of the morning or in the sunny evening as the sun comes and you can hear an aircraft start up, you're walking with the ghosts. Yeah. Um, there's a, an ongoing respect that all of the people on the site have. And we, 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 if there was something that suggested that's maybe a little bit too Disney or, well, how about yeah. we you know, host this or host that, oh, the lads wouldn't like it. And when we're referring to the lads, we're not talking about the volunteers. Mm. You know, we're not talking about the staff. We're not talking about the team. We're talking about the guys who were there. Yeah. Um, we we lost ten of our guys, um, and eight of them actually came to their finals and were given last orders and stuff on site. 
Um, our mortuary is there, um, and it's a matter of some respect the way we treat all the buildings. So yeah, mm. we have our ghosts. We all have our ghosts, but we don't. We don't think they've got chains and rails. Good way of putting it. Mm. Do you think you'll put a um, use the mortuary for a kind of chapel, or is there? Uh, ironically enough, we we did use it for a chapel for something, but um, no, there's mm. there's no there's no long term plan for that at the moment. Mm. Um, there may be some kind of medical display in, in, in the future. It's being used for a different purpose right now. Um, but we're, we have to be very careful because one of the phrases I use on a regular basis is we're a, a museum, not a mausoleum. Mm, yeah. So the very act of our preserving mm. and renovating this site, and it, it, make no doubt about it, it's an active site. It's not mm. just something that comes to life on Remembrance Day. Mm. It's, no. it's not about that. It's, there's a lot more about it. Um, as an example, the Blacksmith Forge, which, uh, as I said, was, was knocked out in the Second World War, by that errant German, um, it's been rebuilt, it's functioning, and we now host blacksmithing courses in it, the historical hammerings mm. course, which is sold, sold out immediately. Now, to me, there's an act of remembrance there that I'm watching a guy, and the guy we use is a fantastic fellow called Peter Trek. he's a Whitechapel foundry, time-served blacksmith. He's doing what they did in the place they did it, in the Brilliant. way they did it. Mm. And if that's not a fitting tribute and an act of remembrance, I don't know what is. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, we've got to go up there. That sounds like a, yes, it sounds, sounds like, like a, a definite on the top of the list, I think. Yeah, so, so talking about that, coming to see you then, where, what's, are you open all year? What's, what's, your, what's your arrangements? We've just gone into winter opening, which is three days a week. Mm -hmm. um, it's a matter of some pride that we're one of, uh, one of the only museums I know of where you can arrange to arrive by air or by land, which is quite nice. I was going to uh, ask you about <laughs> that. Yeah, that is, um, so, uh, PPL. Uh, no problem at all. PPL, all the details are on the site. You can get into poolies and stuff. So if you want to come in by air, just give us a PPL shout. We have a uh, phone cover for that. It'll be either myself or the Aerox manager will, will give you a briefing. You can come in, no problem at all. Um, at the moment, three days a week, uh, we have a close season over the very, the very depths of winter. So December, latter part of December into January, we do close, so we can do a lot right. of work then. But then we're back open mm. again, February, and we go up to summer opening uh, Easter next year, mm. but uh, three days a week at the moment. During the summer, five days a week this year, um, and PPL not a problem. 680 is our longest strip by st what straight briefing. What about a Wessex helicopter? Yes. <laughs> Much as I'd love to, unfortunately we can't accept them. We're not allowed rotary. Oh, uh, not allowed rotary balloons, gliders well, or anything. Single engine, fixed wing is all we're all about. Right. Oh, well, there's oh. a charm in that. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. We it's might enshrined find, in we the might find a First World War aircraft to sponsor in there. Yes. <laughs> there exactly. So if we want to see a First World War aircraft, it, see some flying up there, what's the best, as a, as a punter, as a spectator, when's, when's well, it best to come the, up? The first thing is that there's always aircraft operating. If weather permitting, whether it be the modern resident pilots, which we're very lucky and proud to have, or whether it be some of the historic aircraft, there's always aircraft operating if the weather permits it. We can't guarantee when that will be, obviously, but uh, with the, co the highest concentration of flying is one of our flying events. Um, there's uh, the big flying events, uh, most successful ones to stick in the diary are the Wings and Wheels one in May, which is uh, usually Sunday around the 19th. Yeah. And then we have the full living history event, Stomar is at War, which is uh, fantastic successful. We're very proud of that. Um, and we've had everything from the Bristol Scout flying, we, the BE2 always goes up if the weather allows it. Um, we have all sorts of things flying there. The Albatross is back again now. Right. So, oh, yeah, I mean, right. two days of solid flying there, weather permitting, and wing, Wings and Wheels is one day. But then there's other days where, you know, the Newport 17, bless him, the, the owner operator of the Newport 17, I think we'd have to get him some concrete boots to keep him on the ground <laughs> because he's so much in love with that aircraft that uh, we have to work very hard to keep him on the ground as opposed to in the air. Um, oh, right. It's a wonderful site, it really is. Um, to quote a, a name drop here, but Dan Snow is one of our uh, patrons. Yeah. And he was there too, doing some filming when uh, John, the owner operator of the, the Newport, took off. Um, and he was with uh, another owner operator, we've got Dave Blackstone, who's got an SC5A. And they both went off and he just looked at it and he turned to me and he said, now that, that, and he cocked his head to one side, that's the beating heart of Stomaris. <laughs> and it's true. The sound of Bruce's, we love it. Brilliant. 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 Excellent. It sounds absolutely fascinating. I think we're going to have to wrap it up there, but mm. that sounds great. And we are going to come and see you because this, this, I'm saying, it's um, open my eyes. Yeah, it's mouth-watering. Good stuff. Excellent. Right, great. Do get in touch with us if you've got any stories of interest. Please do follow us on social media and remember to subscribe to this channel. Till next time, goodbye. Fancy coming along to an Aviator's Lounge recording? Why not join us for our Christmas special at Damon's Hall on the 7th of December? For more information, please see the link below this video.